inventive, audacious, and with an effervescent imagination and a continual willingness to call traditional notions of art into question, Man Ray was the quintessential avant-garde artist. Born in Philadelphia in 1890 and raised in Brooklyn, Emanuel Rednitsky, later known as Man Ray, was always determined to become an artist. Man Ray came into his own in the 1920s when he joined his good friend and fellow Dadaist, Marcel Duchamp, in Paris. To earn a living while pursuing the more iconoclastic work that he loved, he took portrait and fashion photographs, eventually becoming the most celebrated commercial photographer in Paris. Man Ray began his 50-year career as a painter and designer and soon expanded to collage, printmaking, photography, object making, sculpture, and film, never attempting to establish a hierarchy for his various activities. In 1940, Man Ray moved from Paris to Hollywood after the Germans occupied the city. Six years later, in 1946, he marries Juliet Browner in Beverly Hills at a double wedding with Max Ernst and Dorothea Tanning. Nude, 1912. During Man Ray's apprentice years, he gloated over reproductions of Greek statues and Ingers' nudes and made drawings of them, ostensibly in charcoal and pen and ink. The drawings that Man Ray executed around 1912 are notable for their free and limber line. In Nude, the artist captures the model's pose in firm and assured strokes. The same undeniable mastery of drawing is evident in other of his youthful works, both in such portraits as Self-Portrait, 1914, and such landscapes as Ridgefield, 1913. The River, 1914. Looking at this early figurative work, the spectator can easily see the coloration of the fauves. The Village, 1913. Passages in Man Ray's landscapes from this period bear obvious resemblance to the paintings of several cubists. Whereas a number of Man Ray's works continued to exhibit a bright, colorful fauve palette, untitled 1913, others relied on the structural simplifications of cubism. The Lovers, 1914. Man Ray, 1914. In this picture, Man Ray simply but emphatically employed his own name and the date as a subject. Painted when the artist was 24, the work must have been for Man Ray a profoundly satisfying act of symbolically making his mark on cubism. The dismembered letters are bold, simple forms that fill the picture frame and assure colossal proportions. Only partly emerging from the shadow-filled gashes of paint by which they were formed, they suggest the mystery and magic of the great analytical cubist works. Portrait of Alfred Stiglitz, 1913. Ramapo Hills, 1914. Ramapo Hills, 1914. Black Widow, 1915. Promenade, 1915. Arrangements of Forms, Number 1, 1915. Dance, 1915. The 
The Rope Dancer Accompanies Herself with Her Shadows, 1916. Self-Portrait, 1916. This painting is a mixed-media assemblage that consists of a vertical panel painted in black and aluminum, apparently meant to represent the shape of a doorway. Upon the panel are affixed two doorbells and a push button, as if to suggest that if one pushes the button, the bells will ring. This was not the case, however, and Man Ray never intended to set up a simplistic stimulus-response demonstration, as in a psychological experiment. Ballet Silhouette, 1916. The Revolving Doors, 1916-17. Man Ray's experimentation with spectrum-colored papers provided not only the inspiration, but also the modus operandi for an entire series of collages from this period, each of which was supposed to serve as a preparatory study for a larger work in oil. The series consisted of 10 separate collages, the individual panels of which were prepared from carefully cut pieces of construction paper, pasted onto white cardboard. For their first installation, each collage was separately framed and hinged onto a rotating support so that the entire ensemble could be spun around like a revolving door, hence the title, The Revolving Doors. Each panel was also assigned a somewhat unusual, though generally descriptive, title. Mime. The title was probably suggested by its anthropomorphic shape, which, with its vertical colored striations and outstretched arm-like forms, recalls the quiet movements of a mute clown. The first five images reflect the formalist principles Man Ray had established for an art of two dimensions. They are inherently more pictorial, that is, their forms more completely reflect the surface of their rectangular support and thus reinforce our awareness of their planar expanse. Long Distance, Orchestra, The Meeting, Legend. The latter five, on the other hand, are more iconic. In spite of their basically abstract designs, they exhibit obvious figurative associations. This does not imply that their designs were generated by specific, recognizable imagery, but that these works intentionally direct the viewer's attention to something else, that is, to something other than what they are. In other words, while the earlier designs emphasize the physicality of the works themselves, the latter five collages emphasize the physicality of the objects alluded to in their titles. Decanter, Jeune Fille, Shadows, Concrete Mixer, Dragonfly, Boardwalk, 1917, New York, 17, 1917. New York is an assembly of wood strips held together by a C-clamp. We immediately see more than the simple elements with which the object was constructed. The sleek, vertically ascending angular profile recalls a New York skyscraper in the sharp geometric style of numerous high-rise buildings then under construction in Manhattan. Decollage, 1917. By itself, one. 1918. By itself, two. 1918. Painting, 1918. Aerograph, 1919. For this aerograph, an oval mimic of the great synthetic cubist works of Picasso and Braque, 
Man Ray used the sculpture by itself too as a stencil, painting its shadowed outline with his air pressured spray gun. First object, 1919. La Logique Assassine, 1919. Woman or Shadows, 1919. The artist arranged certain objects from his darkroom to create the likeness of woman. Two metal light reflectors and six clothespins attached to the edge of a plate of glass are illuminated in such a way that they are duplicated in sharp shadow. The paired circular reflectors in woman can be seen as breasts, while the angular pattern created by the glass and the evenly spaced rows of clothespins create a highly provocative channel of entrapment, suggesting that the slightest touch could snap the panel shut like the leaves of a Venus flytrap. In this context, the circular opening at the upper convergence of the glass plates alludes, perhaps, to a singular orifice an anatomical metaphor for woman. Lampshade, 1919. Generally regarded as something to be discarded, it does not thereby lose its importance as a springboard for what may be considered more valid productions. La Voliere, Aviary, 1919. Admiration of the orchestral for the cinematograph, 1919. Sekedia, 1919. Obstruction, Assembly Instructions, 1920, 1964. Obstruction, 1920. From 1920 to 1921, Man Ray completely, though only momentarily, abandoned his commitment to the traditional materials and techniques of painting. Instead, he developed an almost obsessive affection for the object, which he manipulated, adapted, or incorporated into his work with what can best be explained as an innate Dada sensitivity. New York, 1920. Perhaps even closer to the aesthetics of Dada was Man Ray's treatment of discarded materials as valued artifacts, as in this object, which he made from nothing more than a jar and some ball bearings. Transatlantic, 1920. Gambling on what he believed to be the future direction of American art, Man Ray was among those who tied their fortunes to the ephemeral and often shifting perspectives provided by the Atlantic crossings of the artistic and literary avant-garde. To symbolize this melding of the old and new worlds, he created a collage framed by cross-hatching and checkered shapes, playful reference to canvas and perspective, comprising a Dada photo entitled New York 1920 and a map of Paris, between which he inscribed Transatlantic. New York, 1920. Represented by a scattered configuration of used matchsticks, a cigar butt and ash, a scrap of newsprint, and mashed metal strips seemingly awash on a gray shore, had been the scene of artistic innovation encouraged by the presence of Duchamp and Picabia during the war. Eighth Street, 1920. Man Ray's virtuosity in photography became a key part of the modernist revolution. As a deliberate attack on traditional aesthetics, discarded and discardable objects, like a crushed tin can, were made beautiful by the silvery tonalities of the photographic print. Danger, Dancer, 1920. 
The subject of this work is none other than the geared wheels used in machinery to transmit motion. The title is inscribed on the image in such a way that it can be read either as danger or dancer, contributing to the ironic and ambiguous effect of the work. Catherine Barometer, 1920. Barometer case with coil and color chart. Coat stand, 1920. This is a photograph of an ephemeral object, a mix of nude and painted display mannequins, simultaneously covering all media while giving none precedence. L'Inquietude, 1920. Priapus Paperweight, 1920. Dream of Pure Culture, 1920. Compass, 1920. The Riddle, The Enigma of Isidore Ducasse, 1920. At this time, Man Ray was developing an interest in vanguard French literature. This work perhaps best exemplifies this new influence. It is a photograph of an unidentified object or objects wrapped in the folds of a thick carpet, which is in turn tied with rope. Man Ray wanted the viewer to believe that two rather commonplace objects were hidden under the carpet. The only way a viewer could know what they were, though, and thus solve the riddle, was to have been familiar with the writings of the obscure, though extremely influential, French author Isidore Ducasse. Boxing Match, after Marcel Duchamp, 1920. Cadeau, Gift, 1921. Cadeau is irrefutably Duchampian, both in its conceptualization and presentation. Cadeau is a case of displacement, aesthetic transactionalism, and black humor. The object is removed from its familiar context. Connections between it and other aspects of material culture are obliterated and represented to the spectator in a position normally reserved for works of art. As if to fight any laziness in the spectator's critical perception of the object, Man Ray attaches 14 tacks to the functional surface to underscore its decontextualization. Conceptually, the work is one shot. It surprises, delights, and shocks. L'Hôtel Meublé of 1921. The small wooden assemblage, a combination bookshelf, floor plan, cabinet, crosses the seamy connotations of life in furnished rooms with a neat structure, suggesting the niches and categories of the mind. This wood relief reflects sources ranging from Picasso to Kurt Dreyer's Société Anonyme. André Breton, 1921-1980. Delicious Fields, 1, 1921-22. Delicious Fields, 2, 1921-22. Delicious Fields, 3, 1921-22. Delicious Fields, 4, 1921-22. The Hands of Antonin Artaud, 1922. Untitled, 1923. While Man Ray certainly glorified women, he made fun of them as well. A firecracker, a needle, some torn paper, and a doily form a woman's head in this rayograph making perhaps a comment on Kiki's explosive personality. Writing Materials for a Poem, 1923. The work virtually answers its own question, from what to write a poem? Sewn together things present a poetic idea whose structure resides in language. The quill, paper, and cardboard, as well as the nameplate and frame, belong to the tradition of Apollinaire's street poetry. In his transposition of poetry into the world of things, Man Ray frees the poetic from imprisonment in the written word. The nameplate was purchased at a flea market. Object to be destroyed, 1923. The motion of the object to be destroyed, real or imagined, provides a temporal geometry 
a perfect sequence of intervals within which one performs a piece. Equipped with the eye of God, who is created in the image of man, the object becomes a brilliant parody of terminism, a concept that establishes a set interval of grace in which man is allowed to perform and win approbation. Untitled, 1923. Kiki, 1923. Violon de Ingres, Kiki de Montparnasse, 1924. Acrobat, 1924. Regatta, 1924. Businessman, 1925. The male mannequin in this collage springs from a standing position up into the air and down again, lines tracing its course. Fashion photograph, wooden mannequin, 1925. Fisherman's Idol, 1926. Emak Bakia, 1926. In Emak Bakia, the scroll, peg box, neck, and fingerboard of a stringed instrument function in a like manner, determining the intervals through which play or music is processed. The strings, however, are frayed, unraveled, resembling the hair of a worn-out bow. Man Ray reminds us here of the dependent relationships between the things played and the instrument that plays upon them, an eloquent metaphor for the constraints on creative freedom in the impoverished context of Orthodox culture. Antonin Artaud, 1926. Snowball, 1927. What We All Lack, 1927. It breathes life into creation, and the bubble, the orb of the individual, mirrors in its tenuousness and delicacy the world from which it is composed and within which it finds its context. Untitled, 1927. The Primacy of Matter Over Mind, 1929. Tableau Tongu, 1, 1929. Jean Dumond, 1929. Prayer, 1930. Surrealist Composition, 1930. Egg and Shell, 1931. Non-Euclidean Object 1, 1932. Non-Euclidean Object 1, with its tightly, wildly knotted rubber tubing pressed close against a geometric shape, expresses a disquieting tension. It both evokes and defies our culture's most revered scheme for making order of things. Its rational structures undermine themselves in such a way that their poetic associations supersede their scientific ones. Like the object to be destroyed and Imak Baki, it has attributes of the human condition, which is both dependent on rational conventions and yet also seeks liberation from them. Self-Portrait, 1932. This consists of a bronze cast of the bust, which he fitted with a pair of his own spectacles and placed in a wooden box. Just like any paper-stuffed shipping crate, the package of Man Ray was packed and ready for delivery. A reference to the death masks made of prominent figures, here surrounded by the ephemera of everyday news, the object is both a witty and profound statement on the artist's entombment in his work. Automobile, 1932. A 
Observatory Time, The Lovers, 1932-34. Curtain, 1933. The Lovers, My Dream, 1933. Mir Universel, 1933. This work may, depending on one's frame of mind, indicate a universal end goal or a thing aspired to, like a classical ideal. It could also as easily refer to a target. Man Ray reinforces the militaristic, violent associations of the term by juxtaposing the three graces with geometry that as much stimulates artillery and weaponry as it suggests classical order and classical sources of inspiration. Veiled Erotic, Merritt Oppenheim, 1933. Saddle, 1934. Natasha, 1934. Black Dress, 1934. Cover of the album, Photographs by Man Ray, 1920, 1934. Burnt Bridges, 1935. This is a sinister object event that consumed itself in fire, forcibly reminding us that the role assumed by any object is subject to change. It is unique in Man Ray's oeuvre, for it comprises a series of events over a period of time. The Orator, 1935. Origin of the Species, 1935. Collage, L'Age de la Colle, 1935. This is an assemblage of drafting materials with a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Woodman engaged in sex in one corner and a dark photograph of a decapitated female torso, a plaster cast, in the other, the whole smeared with glue. The mechanical human reappears elsewhere, a woman who can be assembled in a moment, like a toy, with shiny metallic thighs and a torso sliced in two by a pane of glass. Varlop, 1935. Characters, 1935. Max Ernst, 1935. Venus Restaurée, or Torse Habillé. 1936. Main Ray, 1936. Dora Marr, 1936. Space Writing, 1937. In 1937, Man Ray experimented with a variation on the rayograph, this time using a camera with the shutter open in the semi dark. Sitting in front of it with a small flashlight, Man Ray drew in the air and thus onto the film. The white arabesques of movement between the blobs of rest have a physical scale that corresponds to the reach of the arm of the blurred yet recognizable artist whose body fills the frame. The wheelbarrow of Oscar Dominguez, dress by Lucien Delong, 1937. Mannequin, 1938. Before Man Ray left for America, he was involved in the International Surrealist Exhibition of 1938. Besides the lighting, Man Ray was responsible for one of a series of female dummies that lined the hall, a surrealist street, leading to the main exhibition space. Each mannequin, by Arp, Dolly, Duchamp, Ernst, Miro, Tanguy, and others, presented something of an introduction to the show, as well as the artist's self-portrait. Imaginary Portrait of D.A.F. de Sand, 1938. Not Understood, 1938. The Letter A, 1938. 
The Wall, 1938. Le Rebus, 1938. La Fortune, 1938. La Fortune, 2, 1939. Parasol Décollage, 1939. Fair Weather, 1939. When the boat that had carried him away from warring Europe docked in the port of Newark in late summer of 1940, Man Ray was an artist without a country. Although still a citizen of the United States, he had been a resident of Paris since 1921, an American well known to European audiences, but virtually a stranger in his native land. He had been forced to abandon his most important works of the last 20 years. Unstretched and rolled, his canvases were buried beneath the floors of generous friends. In their attics, fragile objects and glass negatives were boxed and stored. With everything else, Man Ray had left behind his acclaim as an artist. No wonder that as the boat docked in safe harbor, he was overcome with a feeling of intense depression. For the most part, New York in the 1940s embraced the refugee artists, especially the Surrealists. Swiftly Walk Over the Western Wave, 1940. Palatable, 1940. Repainted Mask, 1941. The same satisfaction that attends normal makeup can be carried further by a complete transformation of facial anatomy, borrowing motives from nature. Key Dream, 1941. A sketch and version leading to variations with the same background, leading to the immaculate conception. Non-Euclidean Object 2, 1942. A variation with flat instead of curved planes. Picture with a Handle, 1943. Just as one might say a picture with a story, or a picture with a moral, or simply a picture with its frame. Traced Objects, 1943. Like applied objects are simply tied together like the links of a chain. Optical Longings and Illusions, 1943. This collage uses anatomic arrangements as a kind of happy background. Artificial Florist, 1943. Here he seeks to replace the absence of odor with permanence of the bloom. He demands the same indulgence in this respect accorded to legitimate painters. Man Ray discovered Hollywood on his way to retire in Tahiti arriving in early November 1940. In fact, he followed a migration of European artists to Hollywood that had begun in the 1930s. During the war, Los Angeles provided more support for artists than any other American city. Self-Portrait with and without beard, 1943. Night Sun, Abandoned Playground, 1943. Juliet, 1943. Windbag, 1944. Optical Hopes and Illusions, 1944. Despite its tuneful title and banjo shape, it is an ominous toy that makes no sound, but rather 
like a deceitful pendulum, entertains through distortion. Mr. Knife and Miss Fork, 1944. Enough Rope, 1944. This is the contrary of the proverb. In reality, it is a very small portion of the total length allotted. Domesticated Egg, 1944. Table for Two, 1944. Throughout the 11 years he spent in Hollywood, he enjoyed the company of sympathetic actors and directors who often engaged him in projects as an unofficial consultant or used his objects or paintings as props in films. Silent Harp, 1944. He can hear color as easily as he can see sound. Contraption, 1944. One of the elements is the inspiration for the title. It cannot be condemned as a pun any more than the first syllable in punctuation. Untitled, 1944. Guitar, 1944, harkens back to the category of the silent instrument. The twisted branch is the counterpart of any counterpoint. Ombre de, 1944. Monogram, 1944. On a pedestal, slightly adjustable and movable. Sun package, 1944. A typical Western product may be sent anywhere. The broken glass offers greater facility for light to enter. Proverb, 1944. The Oculist, 1944. As the title derives from the object and not the object from the title, just as its elements are composed of extraneous materials, the effect must be one of opacity. Tourniquet, 1944. Makes sense in the sense that the measure of one's courage is the measure of one's in consciousness. Equivalence, 1944. Are the result of tensile strengths and weaknesses which, by creating a stalemate, produce an illusion of perpetual motion. Landscape with a cow. 1944. Lifesaver, 1944. Like a picture with a handle, must be met halfway with equal buoyancy and outstretched hand. It has no means of self-propulsion. Abracadabra, 1944. There is no composition, no aesthetics, no art, no virtuosity, no admirable texture, but to more so ever so slightly is such a relief. The Mirage, 1944. Transplanted to the home, reflects numbers, projects shadows, turns and oscillates without departing from its base. Square Dumbbells, 1945. Photographic Preservation, 1945. It is one of the means by which transitory objects can be turned into enduring images. Obelisk, or Pieter, 1945. Breakfast, 1945. Anagram, 1945. Optical Hopes and Illustrations, 1945. Stopwatch, 1946. It is one of the means by which transitory objects can be turned into enduring images. Fortune 2, 1946. Having heard from newly liberated Paris that his small house in saint germain en laye had survived the war, he was even more pleased to find that much of his art had survived as well. 
1947, he went to Paris to gather his paintings, photographs, and prints he had once thought lost, and had them all shipped to Hollywood. Man Ray was like an artist reborn. Café Man Ray, 1948. Permanent Attraction, 1948. In America, however, his audience was too small, its response too limited. Having experienced success in Europe, never in America, Man Ray not surprisingly chose to return to Paris in 1951. Macbeth, 1948. Indicator, 1952. Mirror to Die Laughing By, 1952. It's a Small World, 1952. Bookbinding, 1952. Between 1953 and 1960, Man Ray hosted a series of one-man exhibitions in Los Angeles, Paris, and New York. He also participated in several prestigious exhibitions honoring Dadaist and Surrealist art. The Dada Expositions in Amsterdam and Dusseldorf and the Exposition Internationale de Surrealism, Eros, in Paris. Leather Shadow, 1953. Monument to the Unknown Painter, 1953-55. White, the Black and White Room, 1954. Mirrors, silver, concave, and yellow. The tricks of today are the truths of tomorrow. French Ballet, 1956. The last resort to turn. Mon dernier ressort tourné. 1956. Astrolabe, 1957. For self inspection and for self evaluation without conclusions. The Egg Flat, 1957. Talking Picture, 1957. In spite of all efforts to juxtapose two irrelevant objects, one can always relate them, as in this case, a loudspeaker is a horn. Literary Trailer, 1958. N for Nothing, 1958. It's Springtime, 1958. Blue Bread for Blue Bird, 1958. Natural Painting, 1958. Smoking Device, 1959. Architecture, 1, 1960. Featherweight 1, Pas Plume 1, 1960. Domesticated Virgin, 1960. Exactitude, 1960. L'Inconnu de la Seine, 1960. Person to Person, 1962. Enough Rope 2, 1962. Seismograph, 1962. In 1963, Man Ray published his autobiography, Self Portrait, in London. Anti Theft Device, 1963. Man, 1963. Pandora's Box, 1963. The Happy Hours, 1963. The Wonder, 1963. The Hammer, 1963. Allume tes gitanes, 1963. The Letters, 
1963. Close Up Fold Up, 1963. The New Man, 1964. Satellite, 1964. Featherweight 2, 1964. Serious Man, 1965. Striking Things, 1965. Prenez garde à la peinture sèche, 1966. La Jurassienne, 1966. Le Manche dans la Manche, 1967. Golden Lips, 1967. The Lost Glove, 1968. Pêchage, 1969. La Poire d'Eric Satie, 1969. Voilà, 1970. Serious Man, 1968-72. The Family, 1976. Between 1973 and 1975, the New York Cultural Center organizes an exhibition in honor of the 80th birthday of Man Ray, entitled Man Ray, Inventor, Painter, Poet. Man Ray died on November 18, 1976, in Paris. <laughs>